Welcome, everyone. Thanks for your patience. I'm Letty Bass, and I'm uh, chairing this meeting today. Um, thank you for your patience online, too. We had a little phone technology issue this morning. So um, I'm, will someone online speak up if you can hear us, if you are joining us? They're all good? Oh, good. So um, we're going to start um, by going around quickly. With, we have a wonderful group here today. Uh, just introduce yourself and your organization, and then uh, we'll read the names of everyone who's on the phone. So, starting with me, Letty Bass. Chris Miller, Denver Preschool Program. Lisa Matter, Spending Quality and Infant Toddler Care. Ben Gressley, Lakeshore Learning Materials. Akane Ogren, Colorado AUIC. KT Montoya Price, the Colorado Children's Campaign and the Raise Colorado. Oh. And there's microphones, sorry, on everyone. Near everyone. KT Montoya Price with the Colorado Children's Campaign and the Raise Colorado oh. Coalition. Peter, Office of Early Childhood. Kristen Lang, Office of Early Childhood. And William Beckery, Office of Early Childhood. Uh, Spencer McCauley, uh, Colorado Governor's Office. Erica Newton, uh, Colorado Interagency Coordinating Council parent member. This doesn't work. It's hot, too. Eileen Howard Bennett, Better, <laughs> Better Child Health and Development. Kelly Bowes, Denver's Early Childhood Council. Kelly Path with the Colorado Jewish Early Childhood. Karen Schneider, Healthy Child Care Colorado. Uh, Christina Novario, I'm here for a UNC class requirement. Toby, <laughs> 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 and I'm here for the same reason. <laughs> Bill Jager, I'm here because I want to. <laughs> from the Colorado Children's Service. Laura Knudsen from Parent Possible and the Colorado Home Visiting Coalition. Okay. And do you want to read the names of everyone yeah. who's on the webinar? So we have Alexandra Murphy, Alicia Lacombe, Emil, Amber Bilby, Catherine McCarthy, Connie Fixon, Deborah Young, Denise Fletcher, Emily Bustos, Aaron Mason, Eva Jankowski, Heather Blanco, Heather Hanna, Heather Hawk, Janet Feel, Karen and Bowden, Kimberly Rhino, Christy. Kaliska, Christina Hale, Lisa Jansen Thompson, Logan Lansana Rez, Michelle Sharp, Nakia Collins, no Noemi Aguilar, Pamela Harris, Rosemary Reagan, Sandra Gregory, Sarah Berkman, Sarah Daly, Shannon Beckman, Shannon Hall, Stacey Petty, Sue Low Miller, Teresa Matthews, Teresa Rapstein, Tim and Tim Garcia. Wonderful. Um, let's start with the minutes. If um, anyone has any comments about the minutes from the last meeting, I have one. Um, I, I was chairing this meeting and I asked for um, um, for someone to approve the last minutes and then it says I made the motion and I don't think I did. So I think it was Susan Steele, but we'll check on that. It's a minor uh, correction. Anybody have anything else? Any comments about the minutes? All right. So all in favor of approval, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We're, we have a little change in the agenda because Lindsay Dorneman's not here yet. So I think we're going to start with Laura and Heather, if that's okay. To And we'll just flip and then Lindsay will be here for the next uh, part. So Colorado Coalition for Home Visiting, um, we're going to hear what you're doing. You're going to wait over there. Okay. Yeah. okay. Moving yeah, up to uh, our presentation. Hi. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for being here this morning and listening to our presentation about home visiting services in Colorado. 
I'm Laura Knudsen, and I'm the Director of Community and Government Relations with Parent Possible, and then also chair the Colorado Home Visiting Coalition. And I'm going to be presenting today along with Heather Tritton, who's the Executive Director of Parent Possible. So our agenda for today, we're going to talk about kind of the current landscape of home visiting programs in Colorado. We're also going to tell you a little bit about the PDG pilot um, that's going on with family child care homes, um, and then also just discuss uh, general alignment of home visiting with the school readiness agenda. So um, many of you are aware, but perhaps not all, that there exists in Colorado a home visiting coalition. Um, and we are a number of different evidence-based models throughout the state that collaborate to strengthen and advance home visiting services across the state. Um, not all home visiting models that are delivered in the state are represented on the coalition. However, all are invited to join. And in addition to that, we have many resource partners that help us with our work. So groups like the Children's Campaign, Clayton Early Learning, the Spring Institute, et cetera, um, certainly help us with our work. So I think the first important piece that we want to note about home visiting is that home visiting is not a model. There is not one singular model of home visiting. Um, but really what it is, is a service delivery strategy. And this is a commonality that our programs share. We really focus on making sure that we're able to meet families where they're at. Many times that may be a home, but that could also be a motel. It could be a library, a McDonald's, and also with some of our models, um, perhaps in a doctor's office as well. But I think the main key piece is that we want to be able to overcome that barrier that many families have with traditional services in terms of transportation and be able to meet them in a place that's comfortable for them. Um, additionally, our home visitors, when they are able to go into a family's home, are also able to conduct an environmental assessment, which gives them a lot of ideas about the environment and the things that are happening for that child in the home. Other things that we share with our models, um, they are voluntary. Our families have choice. They are not mandated ever to participate in these programs. We all focus on family support, on healthy child development. Additionally, all of our programs occur at some point between the pregnancy up through kind of the kindergarten entry age period. Um, and we all provide connection and share local resources with families and help them get connected. Another thing that we share is really this uh, two-generation focus, really on the whole family. And all of our programs have a very broad definition of family in terms of who is involved in these home visits, whether it's mom, dad, grandma, auntie, cousin, whatever caregiver is identified as being important in that child's life can participate. So Colorado is very fortunate that we do have a continuum of home visiting services within Colorado. And within this continuum, it's important to note that our programs are very aligned, but they are not duplicative. They all have different purposes and reach different outcomes with families, um, and they also serve different age ranges. Um, and I've shared with anyone that's received the handouts, there's some information about um, the seven programs that are part of the Home Visiting Coalition to give you a little bit more detail into each of these programs. Uh, but in addition to that, this slide kind of details um, some of the, the pieces of that continuum, particularly the age continuum and showing when they uh, do kind of reach families. Um, one piece that I think is important to note on this slide is that um, we note the counties across Colorado that that model is an av available in. And it's important to note that even if a model is perhaps there's a site or it's available in that county, it doesn't mean that every eligible child is able to participate. We certainly still have a lot of gaps, even in those counties that are fully served. 
So certainly we feel that there are a lot of benefits to having this continuum of care and this complementary system. Again, we know that there is no one size fits all one home visiting program. Um, and certainly having all of these options, families have a lot of choice um, in that. Um, additionally, um, we certainly, again, meet those different age uh, and eligibility requirements um, within that continuum. And then when we talk about workforce, it's interesting to talk about the home visitation workforce because we have home visitors that are trained parent educators that may not have an educational requirement to be a home visitor as part of that program. And then we have other models that have much more stringent requirements in terms of education, things like being a registered nurse or a licensed psychologist and so forth. Um, and so there's a lot of variability in terms of the home visitation workforce. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the primary federal funding stream um, for home visitation across the country. Um, the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visitation Program, or MCV, you may have, have heard of, um, was established through the Affordable Care Act um, in 2010. Um, and this provides funding for many evidence-based home visitation programs um, across the country. Um, in Colorado, we utilize MCV dollars for NFP, PAP, and HIPPE. And Colorado in 2018 received $8.1 million um, in uh, MCV funding. And we were able to utilize that across 12 counties um, within the state. Um, so that's kind of a, a large source of where home visitation uh, funding comes. Um, we were fortunate in 2018 that MCV was reauthorized but it was reauthorized at a block grant that didn't increase in size. And so as we all know, as program costs go up, like the number of children that were able to be served with that money has come down. However, there has been an exciting development in Congress. We'll kind of see where this goes. Um, but Representative Danny Davis of Illinois um, is sponsoring a bill to double federal McVee funding. Um, which would be very exciting if this actually went anywhere. He's trying to attach this to a prescription drug package that might actually have a chance of moving through Congress. Um, and so we should have some updates on that actually as soon as next week. So a lot of federal advocates are really working on hoping to get this component attached to that prescription drug package. So more to be, be seen from that, but we're, we're excited about that prospect and at least federally that they're talking about home visitation. So um, certainly in order to make sure that we can effectively deliver home visitation programs across the state, um, we have um, a large focus on our intermediaries. And really intermediaries, their role is not to do direct service. We have sites across the state that actually deliver the home visiting model. But what intermediaries do do is they provide sites with program guidance of how to effectively deliver that evidence-based model. Um, they help them maintain model fidelity, which is really important to achieving the outcomes that the model was intended to um, they help them with data and evaluation support. Um, they're also the liaison often between sites in the state um, and also between sites and the national model that really kind of governs the practice of that model. Um, so we're really fortunate within Co Colorado that we have a number of very solid intermediaries that help with the implementation of these programs. And within that, I think our intermediaries are very, um, you know, focused on stressing the importance of partnerships um, in all different levels of work that we do, whether or not it's with establishing a site within a community to make sure that that model is going to fit for one with that site and also have connection to the families that really want to have that service within that community. And also just to the level of 
you know, we have these evidence-based programs, but there's no way that an evidence-based model is going to be effective if we don't have a home visitor that is supported to the level that they can develop a solid relationship with a family to be able to make that model effective. And so that's certainly something that we focus on and stress in our work. So in terms of home visiting in Colorado, we have a lot of strengths um, and certainly are known throughout the country that Colorado is doing a lot of great things in the home visiting space. Um, one exciting thing is that NFP is available in every county, which is definitely an awesome thing that we have for our state. Um, we also have five counties that have all of our five state funded models at least available. Again, they're not reaching everybody that needs or could be served, but at least have a presence within that county. Again, we have a lot of really wonderful existing sites that have been doing this work for many years and are very solid. We have very trusted and established intermediaries to help guide this work. And we have wonderful relationships um, between intermediaries, between sites, between the state and also with our national organizations. And I think that's helping us really do good work in, in Colorado. Um, however, along with that, as always, we certainly have a number of different challenges. And I'm uh, specifically just going to speak to both reach and then workforce with folks today. Um, so certainly, I think REACH is always connected to funding, and I had mentioned the piece about kind of um, McZ maintaining that level block grant funding, which has definitely decreased the number of kids that we've been able to serve with that federal funding stream in Colorado. Um, in addition to that, as I've mentioned, we've got a lot of gaps across the state um, in terms of the number of kids that could definitely benefit from these services, um, receiving services. Um, we have seven counties within the state that only offer nurse family partnership. And nurse family partnership is an amazing model. They focus a lot on the pregnancy and the prenatal period, um, but they do have eligibility criteria. And it's a model where they focus on first time moms that are low income. And so if you don't get into NFP by the time your baby reaches one month old, or you have another child, or perhaps you're a family with a three-year-old that wants home visiting, in those seven counties, there aren't options for you there. Um, and so that's certainly something that we are working hard to, to shift and change. Um, and again, even in these counties with these multiple models, we've got wait lists and capacity issues. Um, I'm going to briefly exit out of here and show everyone a map. And what this map is documenting is looking at all kids under six um, based on DOLA stats. And this is looking within a one year time period for the seven models that we've shared with the, the coalition and looking at the percentage of kids receiving services in these counties. And as you can see, there are some areas of the state, more of the blue level, um, that we're doing better. So if you look in the San Luis Valley, for instance, Alamosa, Castilla, um, you know, we have close to like a 25% penetration rate. Um, and I think a lot of that is due to investment, including McV dollars and so forth, that is helping fuel that. Um, but we have other counties, for instance, El Paso, 1% of kids in El Paso County, and there's a lot of kids in El Paso County, um, have the option right now to receive um, home visitation services. And also looking like Arapahoe, 1.8, um, even like Adams at 3.5. Um, there's definitely a lot of areas that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and certainly, have been working very solidly with the coalition to collaborate and figure out where we really should be investing more um, across the state. Turn on back here to our slides. Um, in addition to that, um, we have a lot of models that really excel at reaching a lot of groups. Um, but certainly there's many communities that we need to be more connected to. And so that's also a huge component of our work. 
And then um, the final piece before I turn this over to Heather is that I don't think that we can have an early childhood conversation without talking about workforce, also home visitation workforce. And even with the continuum of experience required for home visitors within the state, doesn't matter if we're recruiting for parent educators that, that don't have a lot of experience up to those that have advanced degrees. We struggle in this area, certainly in retention, recruitment, and all of that. And so that's something that we're working on together as well. Um, so I'm going to turn us over to Heather. Here. All right. Um, so I'm Heather Turton. I'm the Executive Director at Parent Possible. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about home visiting and the school readiness agenda, and then some, and then our, our family child care project that we're doing with the PDG, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some policy things that are happening. Um, when we talk about home visiting, we know that evidence-based home visiting programs have a slew of outcomes. And if you look at all of those programs that Laura listed, we could all probably talk about, you know, 20 hours. Um, but these are some that all home visiting programs have in general. They all have some health outcomes. Um, they all have child development. They all talk about positive parenting and reducing child maltreatment. And they all have some school readiness outcomes. Um, each program has a different level, right? So when we're talking about nurse family partnership, that program is very focused on health. When we're talking about HIPPI, for instance, HIPPI, by the way, is home instruction for parents of preschool youngsters. Um, HIPPI has some great school readiness outcomes. So. I'm going to talk about HIPPI just as an example of a program that really fits well with the governor's um, school readiness agenda and really has those strong um, outcomes. But I just want to really point out that we, just like we're a continuum of services, we're also a continuum of outcomes and we touch all of these. Um, so HIPPI is a peer delivered preschool curriculum. And so the way HIPPI works in Colorado is um, often attached to AmeriCorps. So sometimes we call our HIPPI program HIPPI Corps. Um, and our hippie home visitors are often AmeriCorps members who are parents who've already been through the hippie program. And that's an important part of the hippie program is that it's a peer developed, uh, peer delivered by primarily um, people who have been through the program. And it really focuses on role play as its main strategy for delivering um, the curriculum. So basically, um, a home visitor comes into the home sits with the parent, role plays the curriculum. They pretend to read books to each other. They play games with each other. Um, when you start doing hippie, you feel a little silly because you're sitting there with another adult reading a picture book. Um, but it's a very effective strategy because then the parent actually delivers that preschool curriculum to the child. Hippie serves a family with children ages two through kindergarten. Um, and in addition to their weekly home visits, they have group meetings where they bring parents together because one of the things that we didn't talk about is that home visiting really targets families that are isolated. So they might be isolated because of their language, they might be isolated because of their geography, um, because of a whole slew of reasons. And we want to bring those parents together so that they start forming some of those supports and, and are connecting with each other. Um, so that is just sort of a, a snapshot of how the program works. Um, all of the hippie curriculum, it, it is truly a preschool curriculum. So they talk about math, they talk about language, they talk about um, reading, they do gross motor skills, they do science. All of those things are happening within the home. And within the work that we do at Parent Possible, we do evaluations of both uh, parents and teachers and hippie each year. And one of the things that we look at is school readiness. And we see incredible growth in school readiness for uh, kids in the hippie program. So this is from last program year that just ended in June of 2019. Um, at the beginning of the year is the gray at the top. And so we had 21% of the kids who started hippie um, delayed in their school readiness skills. Um, they're 59% average and 19% advanced. By the end of the hippie year, which is nine months, it's like a school year, 7% of the kids were still delayed, 39% were advanced. So we see this huge shift to um, kids being not just ready for school, but being some of the most ready kids for school. So um, this is where when we're talking about school readiness and the school readiness agenda, really thinking about how this can happen, not just in classrooms across the state, but in homes across the state as well. So um, that was just a quick like school readiness. Now I'm going to talk about family child care pro pilot that we've done with the PDG. Um, and this is a little bit different. So we are delivering parents and teachers and hippie. Instead of delivering to the parent, we are delivering it to family child care home providers and family friend and neighbor providers. 
Um, and we are working in the state. We have 44 providers who are signed up with the programs and they are serving 144 children. And I say those numbers very loosely. Those are a minimum. Um, we are not, we're doing an evaluation with this project as well, but we're not to the end of it. So all of our, money, our numbers are shifting and changing all of the time. Um, but we are, with the population of kids that are in this project, we are looking at their school readiness growth as well um, and doing some other pieces that I'll talk about in a second. So basically what we're doing here, support for those home-based providers. Um, we're looking at caregiver-child interaction. That's one of the goals is to improve that caregiver-child interaction to improve school readiness. And um, like I said, they, it's licensed family child care homes and family friend and neighbor situations. These are our partners that we're working with. Um, so you can see that most of them are, are in the rural areas. So um, Arapahoe County Early Childhood Council, they're a PAT site. Um, Bright Futures, which is in Telluride, and they serve sort of that little corner of the state um, doing PAT. Hilltop in Grand Junction doing PAT. F Family Connect, which is in Greeley, is doing HIPPY. And then Ruth Family Center, which is in Southwest Denver, is doing both PAT and HIPPY. Um, Oh, I don't want, sorry, I don't want to go forward. Um, before I turn this briefly back over to Laura, I just want to say that this has been an amazing opportunity because this was part of that first section of PD, PDG. So unlike most of that work that was happening in the last year, um, this was an opportunity for us to deliver services in communities. Um, it has been very well received. We have definitely had challenges in terms of, uh, just like we always do, finding providers, um, getting pe people to stay. but. Um, we sort of went through a, a beginning of this where we struggled to make sure that we had people in the program, staying in the program, and now we're at this place where the providers that we're working with are very stable, they're getting their visits. Um, the uh, PAT curriculum is one that could go for two years. The hippie curriculum is just like regular hippie, it's, it's a shorter program, and so they're wrapping up their visits. So it's 30 weeks um, where they should get at least 15 visits during those 30 weeks. So um, it's been really well received. We're really anxious to see some of our evaluation um, outcomes, and we're really hopeful that many reasons that we get the PDG going forward, but also because we would love to be able to do this for a longer period of time, because even when we do get our evaluation results, it's going to be like, this is what happened in a nine-month project. Um, and we'd really like to be able to see if we can support providers in this way, can we make some big difference in terms of school readiness? and improving those interactions between the caregiver and child and, and having this be a way to support parents. Talk about our bill. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about two opportunities that we also have this year. Um, so Senator Fields actually approached us on wanting to help us further expand home visiting within the state. Um, and so we're currently working with her on a bill for 2020. Um, that would uh, give us that option. Um, this bill um, has language in it that's really going to help us focus on delivering service to communities that we have not have been as successful all across the state within the past. Um, but these would be grants delivered through CDHS for evidence-based programs. So stay tuned for, for more information about that bill. Um, and then the next piece that was very exciting for us that came up November 1st when the governor's budget request came out is that um, he did put in there um, a request both to, um, this is really focused on rural areas within Colorado and kind of expanding home visiting in areas where there isn't access to high quality preschool. And so looking at helping us expand um, to rural hippie sites to include more children, and then also expand Healthy Steps as well, including new sites in rural areas. So we're excited about being included in that budget request. Um, so that's all we have for you today. Um, here's our contact information, but also open to questions. Any questions? Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Laura. Uh, program quality and alignment. Um, I like to stress the alignment, and this was a great example of the work in Colorado to align home visitation, and the data is fabulous because that um, allows us to work on policy when you have the data and you have everyone working together. So Colorado leads the way once again. 
And Lindsay's here, and Lindsay, we're going to turn it over to you to hear an update on PDG. you're going to be tired of seeing me um, <laughs> but thank you again for your time this month as we talk about the preschool development grants so over the last month we have been busy working at the renewal application that we submitted on November 3rd that application is still reflective of the three main outcomes that we've identified for the preschool development grant work so again focusing on formal and informal care environments as well as aligning our systems in Colorado. We also um, focus on the same six goals that we've been working towards through the past year, which includes aligning and coordinating systems, um, innovating service delivery to families, maximizing parent knowledge and engagement, increasing meaningful and equitable access for all children, strengthening business practices of uh, programs across the mixed delivery system, and of course, increasing the quality of ECE environments and the workforce. So in terms of timeline, um, we are now uh, in November, so we've submitted our renewal grant, and now we're turning our focus over to the needs assessment, strategic plan, and project performance evaluation plan. So those drafts are now coming in, and we're working with partners within the office, across state agencies, and soon the ECLC to begin reviewing those drafts. On November 21st will be the first time we have the opportunity to really present these to the ECLC. So we'll be meeting with the executive committee to review the strategic plan to ensure that it's really representative of all the work that's happening in the state, not just what we're planning to do through the PDG renewal application. Um, we will be coming back to the PQA on December 13th to begin sharing both needs assessment findings as well as the statewide strategic plan with this group. We'll then take that to the full ECLC on December 19th, crossing our fingers for an endorsement so that we can forward those on to the federal government on December 20th for their acceptance. Um, upon their acceptance, we really have the green light from our federal partners to begin spending money to be able to support that strategic plan. Um, following that process, we'll begin to distribute these documents broadly. So January and February are really the timeline in which we hope to start pushing out both the needs assessment report and that statewide strategic plan to all of our partners, to uh, families, to anybody who may have an interest um, or is working with children zero to five. In December, we'll also be refining our evaluation plan. That plan really will be targeted towards the outcomes of what's happening within the renewal grant period. Um, that plan will include some continuous quality improvement activities, allowing us throughout the three-year project period to really shift our focus and expand what's working or perhaps pull back or remove what's not. Um, and then finally, you see our timeline still goes through February, so we received informal approval for a no-cost extension. We're just waiting one piece of paperwork, and then we'll start extending contracts with all of our partners and wrapping up the year one activities in February. In terms of the renewal application, we should have notification uh, before December 31st, and so cross your fingers uh, as we wait over the next couple months. So this graphic was shared last month, but I want to revisit um, as we walk through the renewal application, just to clarify that the renewal application isn't the end all be all of what's going to be happening in early childhood in Colorado. So the statewide strategic plan really is going to be a broader document. It's a roadmap for Colorado that's going to go over a period of five years. That plan really is designed to have multiple partners providing governance and implementation activities for that. So we'll definitely be coming back and utilizing the PQA and ECLC as we go through the next five years of implementing that plan. 
In terms of informing the statewide strategic plan, we used both the needs assessment as well as family and stakeholder engagement. Um, again, I can't be more proud of the state for engaging more than 5,000 families throughout all of the PDG activities. And so we feel um, as a state that we've really gone above and beyond and we're um, actually surpassing a number of other states in the amount of outreach we've done to inform these activities. Um, and then in terms of the context or the guardrails, we really want the statewide strategic plan to align closely to the early childhood Colorado framework, as well as reflect the state landscape. So as that landscape changes, so will this plan. The renewal grant really is a funding source allowing us to implement pieces of that strategic plan. We'll have funding for three years if awarded. Uh, the Colorado Department of Human Services was designated as the lead agency. However, we have identified partners throughout our application who will support us in that implementation. Similar to strategic plan, that application was built on the needs assessment and family and stakeholder feedback, but our guardrails look a little different. So we have to look at our year one activities and expand and build upon those per federal requirement. And we also had a, a long list of scoring criteria. And so we wanted to make sure we were intentionally hitting those marks so that we could uh, receive that award. So each, or there was a handout, hopefully everybody has a copy that outlines the scoring criteria for the Preschool Development Grant Renewal application, and then identifies the strategies that the OEC selected with partners to meet those criteria. And so we ended up um, narrowing down a really long list to about 40 activities that we felt were doable in partnership with other state and local agencies. And so those strategies are reflected in that document. Uh, we will be pushing out the application um, later today, and you won't see all of these strategies explicitly called out in there, but know that they are in there, and our intent if fully awarded is to implement what's in front of you, at least in year one, until we have some uh, good data, some lessons learned, and then we know what we can, again, build on or pull back on in years two to three of the renewal period. So moving into an overview of the renewal application, uh, Colorado requested just short of $12.5 million. Whatever amount we're awarded is the same amount we'll receive over the next or over the course of three years. And so our maximum award would be short of $37.5 million for the three-year period. Um, again, we really um, were asked to expand on or uh, build upon the initial work. So our application talks a lot about lessons learned, um, milestones or successes we experienced and how that informed our work moving forward. Some of the key focus points of the renewal application were very similar to what you've been hearing this year. Um, again, making sure that we're supporting coordination, collaboration and quality improvement across the mixed delivery system. Um, expanding access, especially uh, with a focus on rural areas for infants and toddlers and for children who are at risk of or experiencing developmental delays or disabilities. And then again, just being much more effective in our coordination to support transitions so that all children are ready for kindergarten or for school upon entering kindergarten. Now we can dig in. Um, so what I've done here is given kind of an overview of each of the six activities. You have a much more uh, defined list in front of you within that handout. So for the PDG B to 5 statewide needs assessment, they want us to continue to invest in this activity. So Colorado is planning on annually updating our needs assessment. So we've set aside funds that allows us to prioritize any gaps or lingering questions that um, were not addressed in that initial year that we will continue to explore. We're also going to recommend that the ECLC invest in additional needs assessment activities in 2025, which um, aligns with the conclusion of the statewide strategic plan. Statewide strategic plan. So we, um, again, are providing funds that allow for an annual review and update of the strategic plan. The intention behind that is knowing that Colorado's landscape is changing pretty rapidly. Um, by the time we develop this plan, it's likely to already be outdated. And so we want to make sure we're partnering with both PQA and the ECLC to reflect those changes and how we want to uh, invest in future programming 
with that new landscape. Um, next is maximizing parent and family knowledge, choice, and engagement. And so one of the activities that we've done in year one is partner with the ECLC's communication subcommittee to really understand the statewide needs, what's happening, and what we can do better to support family engagement and knowledge. And so some of the findings from um, engaging with that group, as well as some additional stakeholder outreach, is the need for a resource hub. And so building on some of the work that the OEC is doing under the child care uh, Child Care Development Fund is um, enhancing that consumer resource and so really consolidating what exists for families out there and then enhancing that by creating pathways where families can actually um, self-refer or they can work with their physician who can drive them to that site and help them um, sign up for services they may be eligible for. Um, one of the really exciting things that we have under this activity is the development of a parent council under the Early Childhood Leadership Commission. And so we um, are looking at how we can engage 10 to 15 parents regionally representing um, their communities. And the goal here is really to allow these families or parents to be advocates and leaders in informing what's happening across the mixed delivery system. So as we go through the next three years, we'll be getting a lot of data as we do our evaluation, we'll be looking at the strategic plan, and this will be an opportunity to make sure that we continue to have family voice. We also intend to provide resources to these individuals to go back to their communities and be able to lead discussions, um, bring people to the table who may have never been brought into our circles because they're not using our services or they're just really difficult to reach um, to make sure that we're really getting this representative voice that uh, perhaps we do not yet have. Um, next, so this is a repeat from last year as well, is sharing best practices and focusing on professional development for the early childhood workforce. So this is one where I feel like we've gotten um, a lot of really great feedback from professionals through a series of work groups that we've done, through the needs assessment, through an analytics review, so that we feel like we really have a good understanding of what we can do to better support our workforce. So some of the activities that we've identified for the first year are replatforming PDIS. Um, that's not going to happen in the first year. That will be an ongoing project. Um, but just making sure that it's more user friendly and it has capability to really collect the data that would be useful um, to inform future enhancements or supports for the workforce. Um, another activity is looking at consultative roles for our early childhood providers. So um, how are early childhood mental health consultants um, child care health consultants, EQIT coaches interacting not only with providers but among themselves and how are we making sure that providers have an awareness of these resources and use them um, to their utmost ability um, to enhance the work that they're doing. And so we'll be putting together some work groups, um, hopefully coming up with some recommendations and then the ability to push those out in future years. We also have a strong emphasis under this activity around strengthening business practices. So looking at um, not only providers who are just getting into the field, but also those who have um, perhaps struggled in terms of sustaining their business. So what resources through training or just um, connecting them to a small business association to make sure that they have a viable business plan and can operate. Um, next, we just want to make sure that we're building capacity and competencies so that all children can be supported in a quality environment. So how are we making sure that providers have what they need, whether it's financial resources, training, um, those consultative supports to be able to care for children who have special needs, um, to care for infants and toddlers, um, and to provide um, services that reflect trauma-informed uh, best practices. And within this activity as well, we're focusing on early childhood mental health consultation. Um, so how can we expand access by creating a warm line, exploring telehealth options, and then offering um, an expansion of the ROOTS training that was incredibly successful this first year. And I'm going through these quickly, but um, if people have questions, feel free to wave your hand and I'll definitely take a question. Um, so the next activity is again um, improving overall quality in years two to four of the work. 
This one has actually expanded. So now we're um, able to actually do new programming if we wish uh, with this additional uh, set of funds. So Colorado really is building on the initial grant activities under this. Um, so we'll continue to work on moving QRIS to the ERS3. Um, and then we just wrapped up work groups yesterday uh, that are addressing changes to the QRIS framework. And so those recommendations are in formation and are things that we hope to implement in years two to four. And we also plan on completing an additional validation study of the Colorado Shines QRIS to ensure that those changes to the framework um, were the right one. Um, within this activity as well, we're focusing on coaching. So again, thinking about our um, EQ IT or EQ initiative coaches and the Colorado Shines QRIS coaches, we know through the work that we've done this year that there are coaching deserts, meaning that uh, the resources just aren't there to support our providers. And so we are planning on adding coaches at the state level that we can then de deploy to these communities or areas um, we're also thinking about additional supports that we can provide to coaches to allow them to be more effective in those roles. Um, as Heather um, spoke about earlier, we have a really great home visiting pilot, so we'll be continuing to invest in that in uh, this new grant period. And then finally, we are partnering with the Colorado Department of Education uh, preschool through third grade office to invest in a transitions roadmap that will really identify opportunities for collaboration, not only at a state level, but also at a local level to ensure the transitions children experience from zero to five are effective and that we're supporting not only children, but their families and um, educators who are receiving those children. All right, and this is the new one, and this is a big one. <laughs> and so most of our um, funds will be dedicated to this activity, and I think there are some good reasons behind that. So the um, federal partners are asking us to monitor, uh, evaluate, um, support data use for continuous improvement, not only within this grant period, but also beyond. And so under this is where we're talking about enhancements to OEC, IT systems, and data systems. And so during year one, we were able to engage partners to formulate an IT roadmap for the state that addressed not only uh, usability of systems, but some of the business needs that simply aren't being met by our current systems. So we're currently in the process of really digging into that roadmap and identifying those builds that we want to try to complete within um, the next three years to maximize these resources that we'll have to do that. Um, but we do intend to implement a fair amount of that plan. We also want to develop a public facing data dashboard that will allow our partners to be able to access data and start making more data informed decisions at a local level. Um, so I think that's an exciting opportunity. It also just allows us to put stuff out there. Um, so partners really do have the ability to access and learn from what we're doing um, and collecting and learn from each other. Um, and then finally, of course, we have to do a program evaluation plan. And so again, uh, Butler Institute is partnering with us to develop that right now. Um, but a big component of that plan really is focusing on continuous quality improvement. And so um, there's expectations that as we go through the evaluation that we continue to learn and that we course correct to make sure that how we're spending these funds are uh, the most effective and efficient way of doing so. Um, whatever we learn from the evaluation, again, will be utilized in our review of the strategic plan each year. And so it's a great opportunity for us to really, again, focus on that data-driven decision-making as we make plans for Colorado. Um, and then finally, bonus points. So it's a competitive grant. We really want to make sure we hit all of these, and I think we did. Um, so for the first set of points was under coordinate application eligibility and enrollment for families. 
And so we know some great things are happening at the local level that are supporting coordinated applications for families, as well as local navigations to services. So we want to spend some time over the next year learning not only from our local communities, but also from what's happening nationally to be able to make recommendations and identify potential resources so that more communities in Colorado can begin uh, working towards these activities. Uh, next is an infant toddler emphasis. So uh, Colorado is not alone in its struggle to provide quality services for infants and toddlers. And so the feds are really interested in learning um, how we are resolving this. So most of the strategies that you will see in that handout have an infant toddler focus. Uh, we also, once we have the final needs assessment, we'll be able to uh, better dedicate resources to communities and drive them where we see a greater need around infant toddler support. And then finally is collaborative transitions and alignment from birth to the early grades. So again, we'll be partnering with the P3 office to develop a, a statewide roadmap that supports transitions for children. So with that, um, I would say cross your fingers, cross your toes, uh, do a happy dance, <laughs> and hope that we are funded, because um, I think there's a lot of great work that uh, has yet to be um, accomplished. Um, but I am happy to take any questions pending time. Um, we have a few online. For the maximizing parent and family knowledge choice and engagement strategies, will these only be um, early childhood educator program? So no, so the maximizing parent choice, they really want us to go above and beyond, um, like let's say Colorado Shines, right? So Colorado Shines is a really re robust information source that focuses on children's development and connects families to care with the search tool. They want us to take it a step beyond and really identify any need a family may have and connect them to that um, either information or that service. Within maximizing parent choice and knowledge, they do talk a lot about two generation approaches. And so I think Colorado um, has an advantage given that a lot of our activities do have a two gen lens, especially our outreach to families. And so I think um, it sets us up well. And now we, um, we have that knowledge, we just have to build that tool to be robust and able to handle that. Bill? Um, this is a great summary. I really appreciate you putting it together. Um, have you gone through and assigned budget numbers to the strategies in the second column? Yeah, so um, within the full application, there is a budget narrative that provides numbers that would align to those strategies. Yeah, I think that would just be helpful to kind of know like the relative distribution of costs across. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of big buckets of activities, we're looking at um, I think like 980,000 towards maximizing parent choice. The big investment there is, of course, building that online tool. Um, we're then looking at closer to 2 million for um, professional development and sharing best practices. Then we're looking at about two and a half to three in improving quality. And then when we get to monitoring and the data piece, that's about $6 million. So that's really the bulk of our budget is investing in that. Um, that was also where we would be able to earn the most points. And, and that um, budget narrative will be on the Shines Brighter website once the process is served. So uh, actually we'll be posting the full application today, which would include that. And then if you're on our PDG email list, you'll also receive it via email. Thanks. Yeah. How is this work being coordinated with Head Start programs? Yep, so we fully recognize Head Start is part of that mixed delivery system, and so they'll be engaged definitely within activity um, four, sharing best practices across the workforce, activity five, improving quality, and then we do um, especially call them out in activity three, uh, maximizing parent choice and knowledge. So we know that Head Start has great models for engaging families, and so we wanna be able to leverage that as we continue to um, emphasize family voice in the activities that we are doing throughout years two to four. And they also collect great data. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Um, 
how will the application utilize early childhood councils to accomplish this work? Yep, so a lot of the work is happening at um, a state level, but we do call out local partnerships that will be essential to ensuring that we're successful in our implementation. And so as you look to activities, um, the best practices as well as improving quality, we've called out councils as partners in supporting our professionals as well as our um, providers really across the spectrum, so not just looking at ECE um, providers. One of the things that we are still doing in year one is an organizational capacity for both early childhood councils and family resource centers because we know a ton is being asked of these organizations and we want to make sure that they're resourced and um, given really what they need to be able to be partners in this work. And so that analysis is expected to wrap up in February. And then the next um, round of work on that is really engaging um, like a process management facilitator to start having conversations about what those findings were and what recommendations we need to make or implement to be able to support our partners. So it's going to be a little iterative because there'll be definitely some asks, but then there's also opportunities to really understand what is required to fulfill that ask. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, question. I know they're all happening at the same time, so it's really hard to do this, but as you look through what all this work that you've memorized and looking at the potential <laughs> bill around the workforce thing mm -hmm. and some of the other bills that are hanging out, are you seeing a lot of alignment? I hope. We are. So as we're developing the renewal application, we were in contact with the governor's office to try to get some foreshadowing of what that budget would look like. You know, again, I think because um, you know, we had to write the application before that budget's going to be approved. But what we do have is the opportunity in future years is to redirect how we're doing some of these activities. And so if we feel like something that we wrote to in our application is no longer a need because our Scott and our uh, governor kind of took care of that or um, invested funds into that activity, then it gives us an opportunity to redirect and do something different or expand another activity. So I would also add that a lot of conversations that we had were around sustainability, because these are big investments and um, it's not really great when you then no longer have the grants and can't continue that work. And so we built a lot of this with, or selected a lot of our strategies with sustainability in mind and thinking about what could be done at a state level to carry this work forward if needed. Yeah, so we um, definitely, especially the Early Childhood School Readiness Legislative Commission had a lot of conversations about what was coming out of that group. Um, again, to make sure that we weren't either duplicating or, to your point, moving in a different direction. Um, and again, I think the great thing about that is that year one PDG, in a lot of cases, gives us a head start on what's going to be happening within the sledge session. And so, again, if those um, bills are passed, if that funding is secured, then we have a chance under PDG to redirect, knowing that that's happening at a state level. One more? Okay. Um, can you speak to any proposed changes around R&R type supports to communities? No. <laughs> okay. No, we don't address that in the application. So. Next on the agenda, we have Susan Steele and Charlotte Brantley to talk about the work of the data committee. And I think you have copies of um, this wonderful report, Monitoring Me and Measuring Progress. There's a few around the room. There are a few around the room. Uh, yeah, they were sent by email. So um, you'll have it at home if you don't have it here. Thank <laughs> you. 
you retire, you don't really. You keep <laughs> showing up places. Anyway, it's great to be here. It's great to see all of you. Um, Susan and I are still uh, working very closely together with all this data uh, stuff. And we're very happy to, on behalf of the uh, Data and Outcomes Subcommittee, to be with you all this morning. Some of you have already seen this if you came to the last ECLC meeting. Uh, but we're very pleased to be telling you that the report that has been promised for some time is finally out. It's published. It's on the website. Um, Amanda, remind us where on the website do people find it. You also got it in your email, as I understand. Hi, everybody. It's on our website in three places. So you can find it right when on the home page. It's on the top announcement bar. If you click on that bar, it will bring it you to the report. It's also on the data subcommittee page. And it is also on the Areas of Opportunity page. So you can find it in three places on our website. And it was also emailed before um, the meeting. And I think there are at least 10 copies around the room. And you can also email me if you would like a copy. So very accessible. So we have decided not to actually um, publish paper copies of this and have them papering the world. We're leaving it on the website. It's easily downloadable. It's easily printable. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you'll recall, the ECLC went through the process a few months back of determining the three areas of opportunity that the ECLC would be focusing on in its future work. Uh, the first one around uh, access for all kids to high quality early childhood education and care. The second one around the workforce. And the third one is around family um, health and economic security. <clears throat> so the data committee from that point forward spent months, uh, felt like some lifetime involved in those months to pull together um, around each of those three areas some um, indicators. And we didn't want to have a 1,000 indicators on each one because then you get lost in the shuffle. So there's anywhere from about five to seven indicators on each of those three areas um, that would be a place that we could begin to track what was happening. And we used some specific criteria around choosing those indicators. They had to be things where, guess what? There's data already available rather than something brand new. Though we also were keeping track of what we'd really like to know is X, Y, Z, and are there ways that we can work with state agencies, with others who are doing uh, data collection at state level uh, kind of um, uh, indicator work to try to get some, perhaps some additional things in place down the road. The first two and the indicators for those are pretty well set um, for now. We don't plan to add new ones right away. We do want to, however, keep in touch very closely with the PDG and what happens with that, assuming we get that grant. Cindy, I'm sure we are. Um, that there will be uh, perhaps some additional indicators that will come in pl into play because of that work over time. So we're, it's not like we're not going to ever go back and look at these again, but we also want to be able to have baseline data, which is what you see here, and be able to come back. Uh, every year or every other year to look at that same data and see if we're making progress. That third area of family health and economic security is about as big as the entire world plus the rest of the solar system. And so um, you'll see in the report that there is discussion in the body of the report about the opportunity index because there are several measures included in that index that make sense for that particular area. We also did some further work, which is reflected in the appendix, it's B or C in here, um, to show seven indicators that we began to settle on as the ones that we would first begin to track, but there's still some work to be done on those because it is such a huge area and there are so many different players who are collecting data that reflect uh, change over time in families' economics and their um, ability to afford to, to live in certain communities and things like that. Um, as well as in overall family health. So um, that's kind of the status of where it is now. I'm going to stop and let Susan, my colleague, if you want to add additional information now. Just a couple of things. Um, emphasizing baseline that, you know, we know that um, there, things are moving very rapidly with different inputs, with our new administration, all those things going on. But if you're going to see forward progress, or if you don't see it for that matter, you need to start somewhere. And that was the purpose of this, is let's establish a baseline, understanding where it's way far away, way far down the road. But starting with that, 
and also um, being very clear to everyone. We know these aren't all the indicators. Every one of you could come up with at least three more instantly that you know are important or maybe affect your work, et cetera. We understand that as well, but we really wanted to hone in on two or three major places and work very distinctly in that area, not to ignore the others, but to look in that area. And as you look at access and as you look at particularly workforce, Clearly, they are key themes in the PDG and everything else that we're talking about right now. And if access along the lines of if you have enough workforce for access, you get the blending of those two. We think these are really important things to just focus on. As a point of fact, it's, you know, it was a year. It's been a year about since the uh, uh, areas of opportunity were approved. And um, we just finished a retreat for ECLC and reaffirmed these for next year. Again, many other things we could look at, many other up and coming things to uh, talk about. We, we wanted to focus on this particular, these particular ones, this particular emphasis, so that we, again, to start to see some things and hopefully some additional support of these things as we talk about diversity of the workforce or talking about the various access issues. So clearly those things are in mind. Uh, Additionally, as Charlotte pointed out, I think we're very aware at the data committee that there are so there are so many areas that we have interest in, but we do not yet have a an appropriate indicator or way to track. Either there isn't a sort of a measuring stick or there isn't a way to collect and accumulate that measuring stick. So part of the second or another part of the data committee's work is to try and really identify those indicators and uh, those areas we'd like to have some information and where could we go to get them? Who could get them for us? Like the child health survey or whatever. So, and I think maybe through the data that is anticipated through the PDG grant, there might be some answers there as well. So that's a, another opportunity. And finally, just a reminder that we all as the data committee are really clear that we want to be pushing the importance of data, the importance of making these decisions based on real facts as opposed to um, hard strings. You know, hard strings are really important, but if we have limited money, we have to find the places where we can have the most impact uh, as quickly as possible. So I think that's all I got. So just one last couple of comments from me is that I would really like to thank all the members of the data committee uh, who worked on this and some other people who sort of jumped on board to serve on some smaller working groups to get to pinning down these um, initial indicators that we're starting with. And then Heather Matthews was our contractor who actually pulled it all together into this beautiful report. And Christina and her husband uh, also did some kind of final uh, editing and um, her husband had a lot to do with the graphics uh, that you see in here. So it was a, definitely a big team effort and we're really pleased to see this come out. We're committed to it's not becoming a one and done report that then, you know, five years from now somebody pulls it out and says, hey, whatever happened with this? It's going to be continuously updated is the, is the commitment from the ECLC and the data committee. Thank you. Yes, sir. I thank you. Where, is the, uh, where are the seven indicators in this report? Do you have, you have this, right? Okay. Page seven. Page seven? Yes. The bullet? Yes. Yes, and then there, there, each uh, area is then support further. We'll now start with the document. I count eight, but. <coughs> so each area has uh, perhaps a different number of indicators for each one of the three areas. I said five to seven, it may be oh. five to nine, it may be, but it's, it's different numbers for each one. Does that make sense? Sort of. There's yeah. three areas. Each yeah. area has a group of indicators. Yeah. A total of about eight to ten. Uh, across all three areas, it's more than that. Probably closer to 18 or so. Okay. These are them, though, in seven and eight. Yep. Yes. <coughs> and it was very hard to get the, that realm of indicators down to um, to a limited number. I mean, what ones do you prioritize? So you can see that within the category of accessibility, affordability, meaning families need quality. Some got it, one got more than one. And then in workforce, we really, this was funny, we had a, a, a session at the ECLC, and it was so funny because George from the school district, County Canyon City, says, the only thing that matters is pay. 
So I said, okay, well, maybe we'll emphasize that. But I think within the whole workforce, so many things, but recognizing compensation is such a key factor. The study that recently came out says the real difference is pay, and then diversity, which we all know and want to uh, work on. So there were many other indicators, even within workforce. And again, as Charlotte was pointing out, the continuing evolution of the last one, because it is so big with pro, uh, family support, uh, how do you get to a few that makes sense? So Scott, going back to your question, if you look at the at page seven, the first two areas, I believe, have a total of eight among them. And then the third area has got a little bit of discussion here about, on the next page, about the opportunity uh, index. But if you look at Appendix C, there's uh, seven more. And so that would be the theme, if that's answering your specific question about how many for now. Yeah, my question, you had said seven, so that's why I was trying to find the seven, but yeah, it sounds like there's more. Well, there's 15 total among the three areas. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Amanda. Hey, everybody. Um, I sent this out before. It's the subcommittee charge. Um, so we just does everyone have a copy of it? Okay, and then anyone online, I emailed it out with the agenda. So the purpose of uh, the activity we're going to do today and kind of this discussion is to look at this charge, reflect on it. Is this still um, aligning with the work we are doing? Is there anything missing? Um, any suggestions, additions, or changes um, that we would like to make to the charge? What will happen is that we will we can amend this charge and we'll take the recommendations. Letty and the other co-chairs will take the recommendations to the ECLC and at the February meeting, we will approve, vote to approve the recommend, recommendations from this group. So I think I'll give everybody a few minutes just to look it over and familiarize themselves with it if you haven't already. Um, online, I think Therese can pull it up, um, just so if you don't have it on your email, you can have it on the webinar. And just take a few minutes to look at it. If there's anything missing, if this still reflects the work, if there's anything we'd like to change. Yeah. All right. Okay, I see some heads popping up. So, okay. Does anyone have any suggested changes? Yeah. I have a question. Under the ECLC continuous panel alignment, is there a goal line? Or can I make See what you're saying. So, the question was under the strategic plan alignment, there's a goal two and a goal three. It looks like that might be a typo that we're missing. Say that again, Bill. I'm just wondering if there are other goals that this program quality alignment subcommittee don't align with. So it might be adequate 
data. Mm. I don't know what they are. Uh, yep, I think you are right, but I will look into that. Um, I actually don't know the answer, but I think it, this is coming from the ECLC strategic plan, so there's multiple goals, and these are the two that fit with program quality alignment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. On um, the alignment of standards, and then we get down to E, high quality comprehensive early learning standards. I'm just wondering if we could look at a broader definition of standards as it applies to um, program delivery across multiple platforms, not just early learning. So lots have come out in standards. Um, you know, we, ABCD has standards around monitoring, screening, referral, and connecting kids and families to services. Um, through the children with special health care needs, now there are um, standards of um, care coordination standards. So there's lots of standards that still would meet um, the mission, but it feels like it's limited to just the early learning standards. That is a great suggestion. I just wrote that down. I think that is great to broaden the definition of standards to uh, be broader than just early childhood education. And you said there's ABCD has some definitions and children with special health care needs. So through CSHIN, they um, just released um, their standards around care coordination. So if you're a um, um, care coordinators serving specifically that population kids, I mean, you're working now within a set of standards, so I think it'd be really important to, if we're really looking at standards across where kids and families are, that that be broad. Across, I mean, very broad. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Sure. Any others? Anything online as well? Um, just one thought, um, as Lindsay mentioned, the strategic plan uh, for the office is a roadmap for with or without funding, the strategic plan will still be in place. So does this reflect, I think that could be something that the program quality alignment subcommittee could have a guiding role in. Does this reflect that at all? Or is that something we wanted to add in or I have some nods? It needs to be added in. It needs to be added in. Okay. Anyone else? Any thoughts on that? Anyone else? All right. Well, I have two changes or an add in. If anything else comes, oh, yes, I'm just curious because um, in some parts of the document it refers to pregnant women um, or pregnancy, I think somewhere else, but it's not consistent through the document and I didn't know if there was people or what the reasons were behind that. Um, also, I think I would, I know I would encourage us to use more um, inclusive language, so maybe pregnant women and people or pregnant people. Yep. For those of you on the webinar, um, that was a suggestion to use more inclusive language. Um, pregnant women and people instead of pregnant women or pregnancy. You know, Dave, you're looking at this, I think some of that language is coming from the statute. This is a good reminder that um, you have to go back and look at when the statute sunsets. I think it's on, it's on a sunset cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's inclusive. What we Thank you. Did I have another? Yes. Sorry. Um, I also just 
wonder because so much work has gone into with the framework and now we have the website and trying to gather information um, you know about programs and services and it feels like some connection it 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 says about implementation of the framework but it feels like we're missing um, activities um, that we should be discussing related to the framework. So I know the Early Childhood Partnership Steering Committee, we're talking about that that potentially could be a role around that operationalized, um, you know, of the framework. So it feels like there should be some kind of, with all the work you've done <laughs> on framework and website and collecting, but then what? That's a great suggestion. Yes, that is yeah. a great suggestion. So activities related to the framework, promotion of the framework. Well, I mean, just what does it mean to me mm -hmm. in really, if I'm like it's up on my wall and I look at it every day, but I think this subcommittee should have some kind of role in that. Mm -hmm. Great suggestion. Thank you. Sure. Did you have Any other last thoughts? All right, wonderful. Thank you. And I think I'm up again, so yeah. keep going. <laughs> okay, the Early Childhood Summits. As you recall, the Early Childhood Summits were in October. We had three. Um, in Pueblo, Grand Junction, and Loveland, and then a webinar online. And so I just wanted to share a little follow-up from these. We had about 160 people attend these three and 60 people on the webinar. Thank you for those who attended. Um, I know that some of you in the room did. Um, as a reminder, this is office leadership went to these three meetings and discussed um, the office strategic plan, any projects like pro, uh, preschool development grant and uh, Senate Bill 63 and went, did a little overview of the office and then they also um, collected some feedback from the communities. So here I have some themes that came from the feedback. Um, three questions were asked during the forums. The first was what does successful, what success, successful strategies in your community could be shared or replicated across the state. So some themes that emerged were coaching and mentoring models. Participants expressed great local support systems that they have developed for educators, early childhood workforce, and others around coaching and mentorship, mentoring to support the professionals in the field with help with retaining uh, retention of workers. Um, another was local connections and relationships. A lot of people express the way that they came together at the local level to build relationships across programs, such as screening and referral to provide to providers in their local areas, um, that they are aligning a lot of the work they are doing through early childhood councils and other local organizations and coalitions. The second question was um, discussing some of the challenges and what the state's opportunity, the states, how the state should address those challenges and what's the um, opportunities. So funding came up quite a bit um, for a challenge. This came up across lots of different issues. Participants said that the state's role should be helping to support access to funds or for local communities through garner garnering additional state funds for programs, grants, access to training, and other funding mechanisms. CCAP reimbursement funding came up several times as well. Communication um, came up. Several communities noted that state should be a communication hub, ensuring information sharing across programs and services at the state level and aligning of uh, efforts and initiatives. People also mentioned the state's role in general in a general public awareness campaign around the importance of early childhood to the general public. Um, the last thing that came up quite a bit was zoning issues. While this wasn't addressed in all of the meetings, local zoning code issues and regulations were mentioned several times in communities with zoning challenges across um, around providing 
child care specifically in homes. And the last question that was asked for feedback was how can CDHS better support you in your work across these three areas? And two things came from this um, that were themes. Funding, this issue was raised again across different areas of increasing funding to local communities to provide the supports and services in, this, in their areas and support. This theme also emerged and that local communities would like more support generally from the state, including implement, implementation of programs, understanding rules and regulations, awareness of new or innovative opportunities, such as information on, on the ability to form special districts for early childhood, um, and general supports and recognition of the great work happening in Colorado. So those were just some of the themes that were collected um, from all that feedback. So feedback happened, we had an online feedback form and uh, in person at the meetings. So all this was shared back with the office for consideration in thinking about the strategic plan. And lastly, I just wanna thank the program quality alignment and the small group that helped put these together. Um, they were wonderful events and thank you for all who helped think those through and really making the most of those events. So is, is there any questions? All right, well, thank you. I think we have public comment. Do we have anyone online with, no? Anyone here have uh, a comment or anything you want to share uh, with others? Heather. I just want to share that um, we did get a census outreach grant at Parent Possible um, with a reduced scope from what we um, actually submitted, but we're excited we'll be doing outreach um, primarily through our sites and tons of things. Wonderful. That's great. Anyone else? Scott. Yeah, uh, Dr. Gensky, Governor's Office. You all may have seen the Governor's budget release two weeks ago today mm -hmm. for fiscal year 2020-2021. And uh, just wanted to, if any of you have any questions about it or comments, please let me know. And we all, uh, we definitely develop all of your for uh, these things as far reaching in terms of improving early childhood access and quality and coordination across the board in preschool, child care, home visiting, and early intervention. And so I just want to put that out there and to thank you for all of your updates and your great work in helping us inform us about what the needs are in the field. So that out there and really encourage uh, the communication and dialogue. I'm going to play my role and um, do two commercials for Race Colorado. Um, we're going to have our uh, fall coalition meeting next Thursday, the 14th, from 11 to 2. We'll be doing a little bit of a preview of the 2020 legislative session, as well as some training um, around LGBTQIA issues. And then on December 9th, um, we hope you'll mark your calendars. Um, thanks to Hunter's work as the chair of our um, policy and advocacy committee, we're going to have a two-part advocacy training. In the morning, it'll be more in, about the nuts and bolts of how um, an idea be eventually becomes a law, as well as how, as new advocates, do you actually read a bill and um, you know what is the best way to provide your feedback. And then in the afternoon, um, we'll talk a little bit about the differences between advocacy and lobbying. We know a lot of our members um, are restricted or afraid to do lobbying, and so we have a lawyer come in and help you understand those differences, as well as some activities so you can make sure that you're staying on the correct side of the line, depending on your organization's limitations. Wonderful. Anyone else? Any anything to share? Yes. Um, so, uh, in partnership with the Office of Children's Affairs with the City of Denver, we've been invited to apply for a Pritzker Children's Initiative grant. It's um, a multi-year opportunity to really make some systemic change around prenatal to three. Um, so, obviously, we'll be connecting with people in the room around that. Um, so, we're just invited to apply. We don't have it yet, but it would be really great because it would actually be able to fund FTE that would be specifically focused around. Um, the agenda of birth to three and moving that forward um, and definitely connected to the state work that's happening as well as the Senate Bill 63. So we're really excited about that opportunity. 
Great, Emily, thank you. Bill. Uh, November 20th from 12.30 to 2.30 at the Children's Campaign, we're having a strategy session around how we advance the early care and education workforce agenda items at the legislature in the year ahead. So it's less of a policy discussion and more a reflection on the bill that came out of the Early Child and School Readiness Legislative Commission, uh, the items in the governor's budget designed to support the early care and education workforce. And uh, as many of you know, there uh, needs to be a cleanup to the Early Childhood Educator Tax Credit this session. So uh, that's November 20th from 12.30 to 2.30. You can email me. Uh, I sent an email out to about 200 folks who have been sort of engaged in the Early Care and Education Workforce conversation. If you're not getting those, ping me. It's just bill at coloradokids.org. And um, uh, there's a call-in option, a Zoom option for those around the state or who uh, can't be there in person. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Um, so with my co-chair of the Early Childhood Screening and Referral Policy Council, um, we did have to reschedule our webinar with all the closings last week with no. Um, so on November 21st from 1215 to 115 is the um, HIPAA FERPA part one of a three-part series. Um, this first one is um, two presenters just presenting the basics. And then in January and February, it's going to be putting um, the laws into action. This is all relative to around um, developmental screening, referral, follow-up, closing the loop processes. And then the third one in February will be on um, engaging families in um, consent and understanding their role in sharing information. So if you already had registered, you're already registered for the 21st. If you haven't, um, please register and the, the flyer's gone out, hopefully, far and wide. And no snow. <laughs> Anyone else? These are great updates. Thank you. Um, do we have um, any ideas for future agenda topics? And I, we ask this every time. Um, if you want to share here, please do. We're starting a new year. Um, there's a lot going on in the governor's office. There are a lot of opportunities for us to uh, share and align. So please um, email um, Amanda. Um, if you have any ideas for future topics for these PQA meetings, we'd really appreciate it. Um, anything else for anyone else? Amanda, Teresa, anything? Oh, yes. Yes. Right. I just wanted to announce that um, our next meeting on December 13th is going to be an in-person meeting um, to discuss the preschool development grant and it's going to be at the Colorado Health Foundation um, at 1780 Pennsylvania Street. It's at the on the bottom of the agenda and I will change the calendar invite today so you'll get that update. Um, and then we will be continuing our monthly meetings um, through February. So um, we will have December, January, February, and then we're going to reevaluate in February um, our meeting schedule. But so I will be sending those out as well. So you'll get lots of emails from me coming up. Um, so just want to let everyone know, thanks so much for a great meeting. And we're early. So have a wonderful day. Thank you all.